Okay, everyone, let's get started. Um, oh my God. Sorry, one second. Why is this not working? Okay, maybe we'll just uh, go with this for now. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, different ways to use transformer LMs. And so we will first cover um, what we started at the end of last class, which was uh, sequence to sequence. models. Um, these are also commonly called encoder decoder models. And um, the key concept that we were just talking about at the end of the last class was cross attention. So this is what allows the uh, decoder of this uh, model to focus on representations that are learned by the encoder. Um, so we'll discuss that again and make sure it's clear to everyone like where the queries, keys, and values come from. The next thing we're going to do is take a step back and look at all the different components in the transformer models that we've seen so far. So we've seen decoders, we've seen encoders, and there are actually many different kinds of pre-trained models that use different components of this uh, overall um, model that we've talked about. So um, after we finish with the cross attention, we'll talk about encoder only models. And so these are models that do not generate text. Their purpose is simply to encode a piece of text and then they can be used to solve various non-generation tasks. So for example, like text classification or sequence labeling. So the most popular um, encoder only transformer model is called BERT and we will talk um, about BERT's pre-training objective and how to use it today. Um, next we will talk about um, pre-trained sequence to sequence models and so um, in this, this setting we'll talk about the T5 model, which is uh, an encoder, decoder, pre-trained model. So broadly in this class, we will talk about these different um, configurations of transformers, and then we will also cover how you pre-train each language model um, in, a, in whatever configuration it's in, and then how you fine-tune that model to solve a particular task. Okay, so let's get started with um, reviewing the... Um, sequence to sequence model. So I know this was very rushed at the end of last class, so we'll start with just a review. But if you remember, our goal was um, uh, translate, I forget which colors I use, let's say French to English. Right, so in this setting, um, we had some French words move these down a little so I have more room and we um, fed these French words into what we called unmasked multi head, self, attention. So remember the unmasked part is because we're not actually doing any sort of prediction of the next word on the French side, right? This is our expected input to the model is all three of these French words. So there's no need for masking the future tokens here. So, and then remember we had this uh, block that we can um, kind of stack up and have a deep 
uh, transformer encoder with many different layers of this kind of unmasked self-attention. At the end of the day, we're left with these three vectors that um, we call the final layer token level representations, right? So these are the completely contextualized embeddings of the French um, input. So now we had a decoder as well. So um, the decoder's purpose was to actually generate the English words, E1 and E2 and so on, that are associated with this translation. So the decoder, we started talking at the end of class about how it actually contained two different types of self-attention, right? Um, so the first thing it contained was the standard um, masked multi-head self-attention. So this we talked about at length in the previous couple classes, right? This is the masked self-attention that allows the model at a particular time step to only attend to that time step and all previous time steps, but none of the future time steps. <clears throat> right, so in this case, we get these um, vectors here. And now um, we started talking about the cross-attention component, right? So let's uh, take a look at how that exactly works. So we'll take the output of this masked self-attention, so these, um, you know, these three purple vectors at the top here, and we will project each one to a um, query vector. So we'll get, you know, like for each one of these. Oops. Oh god. <clears throat> We will compute a query ve vector by projecting these purple vectors with some WQ matrix that is specific to this uh, cross attention and this layer that we're at, and then applying a feed forward, uh, sorry, uh, um, a an activation function F. So now, unlike in self attention, in cross attention, the keys and the values, they come from um, a different sequence entirely, right? So the whole point of this cross attention is to contextualize the decoder's representations with the encoder's uh, representations, right? If you look at this, these steps so far, there's no interaction between the decoder and the encoder, right? Cross attention is the only way in which the decoder gets information from the encoder. And you can imagine if you're translating a sentence from French to English, it is hugely important to know what the input French sentence was, right? Otherwise, you can't do this translation. So um, cross-attention provides the only connection between these two halves of the network. Um, so in cross-attention, we will project the, oh, I used green for, whoops, all right, I'll use brown for the keys. Oh no, <laughs> it's purple too. All right, whatever. Um, so let's say that these are keys and these are values and these blue ones are queries. And so I'm gonna project each of these uh, final layer token level representations of the encoder to um, a key and value for each uh, time step of the encoder. And now I'm just going to do my normal self-attention computations, except the keys and the values are coming from the encoder, not from the decoder, right? So that's the only change that we're making. Um, so basically what I'll do is at this time step, I might take the dot product here and here and here, and then I will pa pass those into the softmax and then I will um, do the weighted average of these value vectors on the encoder side, and that determines my uh, representation um, at the output of this, this step here. So we'll call this, um, whoops, that's a too small box. Maybe we'll call this unmasked 
across attention. No, oh, I should say multi-head just to be clear. These are all multi-head attentions. And so why is the cross attention not masked here? Why don't we need to mask the cross attention? We need to mask the self attention, but why not the cross attention? What's that? Yeah, so I think in other words, we already have access to all of the French tokens, right? And remember that the masking is applied to these dot products between query and key. So the masking is essentially uh, applied on the key level, right? And we don't, we've already observed all of the keys that occur in cross attention, so we don't need to apply masking. Um, does that make sense? Are there any questions about this? <coughs> Uh, can you say that again? Okay. Oh, oh, I see. So you're you're referring to say like this time step here? Yeah. So here we're still computing the dot product between this query token and all of the three key tokens. So there's. The first English token is not included in the cross attention. Um, so that might seem a little weird, right? Because now this we don't actually know like what the previous English token was. But remember, we do know that in the input to this network, right? Because the input to the cross attention is the output of the masked self attention. So it already is aware of this uh, to formulate the query vector. But another key thing. Um, all right, this is getting too large here, but let's see. Oh, hang on. Sorry. These colors. So uh, let's say the output of this module um, is these three vectors. So we get the output of the cross attention. It's the same three, you know, three vectors that are the, um, the output of this any sort of attention. Um, now, if you think about this, these three vectors at the top, they are a function entirely of the encoder, right? Because they're the weighted average of the value vectors that come from the encoder's final representations. So these three vectors actually have no information about the decoder side um, representations. Does that make sense? Yes, that's right. So the query vectors used in cross attention come from the decoder side representations, but the output of this module is strictly value vectors coming from the encoder side. So you can see that it's critical to have these residual connections now, not just because of the gradient um, optimization uh, issues that we talked about before, but also because if we, and I think I used gray for this, which is not in my shortcut. Um, if we use um, a residual connection from, say, here to here, and then here to here, now the final output here has information from both the decoder side and the encoder side. So the residual connection is actually helping contextualize the final output of both of these attention modules to have information from the decoder and the encoder. So now, um, finally, in an encoder-decoder network, um, when we talk about the layers of the decoder, each layer contains both a self-attention, um, a masked self-attention, and an unmasked cross-attention. So each layer contains both of these operations, so it's actually like two feed forward layers, one to combine all the head representations of the mask self attention, and one to combine all the head representations of the cross attention. So um, let's see if I can draw this in a somewhat reasonable way. Uh, so basically, like this whole thing here is a layer and you can stack this like entire block to get more get a deeper decoder 
So this uh, terminology is kind of strange, right? Because we were referring to multiple layers of the transformer decoder, but each layer has already like all of these different self-attention, feed-forward, cross-attention, feed-forward. So you might also see this referred to as block in many papers, like a transformer block, which uh, takes, uh, it, it consists of self-attention, uh, feed-forward layer, and potentially also cross-attention and another feed-forward layer. Um, okay, so you can imagine like you stack up as many of these blocks as you want. And then finally, your goal over here is what we've seen before. At the final layer, you're going to predict E1, predict E2, predict E3, and we do this through a softmax layer. So um, this, in effect, is actually the very first transformer network that was developed. Um, if you did the reading, I assigned the original transformer paper uh, from Google. It was actually a machine translation model that had an encoder and a decoder. We started this transformer block, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say block, um, this topic by uh, talking only about the transformer language model, right, which did not have an encoder. Now we've introduced an encoder, which you can see is useful when you have a given input and you want the model to predict output conditioned on this input. But for example, here you don't want the model to predict any French words, right? So there's no point in um, having a decoder over this. All right, any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, as I said in response to the other question, um, the attention scores are a function of both the decoder and the encoder, right? Because a query comes from the decoder, the keys come from the encoder. But remember how those attention scores are used. Those are just weights over the value vectors, right? And the value vectors are only a function of the uh, encoder. Yeah, so I, I here the residual connections have a dual purpose. So one is to still like have these shortcuts for the gradient to flow. The second is to uh, kind of add information of both the decoder and the encoder together to propagate it to the next uh, block. So is it necessary to have the same uh, position Ah, this is a good question. So um, I, the, the question is about, do we need the same position embedding for encoder and decoder? Uh, you can even look at this question more broadly, like, do you need the same network for both the encoder and decoder? Because you could share all the parameters in the encoder and the decoder. Um, it's more common to have a completely different set of parameters for the encoder and a completely set of per different set of parameters for the decoder. This makes sense in the translation context especially because you might want to have one uh, network that focuses exclusively on French, right? It might have the French word embeddings and uh, learn how French syntax works and all of this. And you might have another one focusing on English. So this is how the original model was developed. Uh, I haven't gone too deeply into the position embeddings yet. Um, in this original model, the position embeddings are not learned, but they're actually fixed static embeddings. So they are the same for both the encoder and the decoder. But nowadays, it's a little different. So we'll talk about that more later. But there, these are kind of just like hyperparameters. They're like, do you want to use the same position embeddings? Do you want to learn separate French and English ones? Um, generally, they make some difference, but not, not a lot of difference. Instead of these connections, can we have <coughs> so the question is, can we have skip connections? 
So what, what do you mean? Inside a block? Yeah. Uh, so where would they connect to? So like, uh, from first layer, uh -huh. that's the input one. So we maybe like the after the first layer one? Uh, you could. People have tried messing with these, these kinds of connections. And um, there's a paper called Dense Nets and Computer Vision that tries to connect each layer to all of the previous layers, not just the, the last one. Um, these don't really seem to have much effect in, in these kinds of models, empirically at least. Let me see if there's questions on YouTube. Are we trying to build an LM for both languages that we're translating between? Uh, okay, so this is a pretty good question. So in the sequence to sequence model, we are not building two language models. We are only building one language model, and that language model is in English. It's the decoder. The decoder is a language model. The encoder is not actually predicting any words, right? It's also not forming any sort of conditional probability distributions of the next word. So in effect, we are building a conditional language model, which is the decoder, that uh, its output is conditioned on the previous English words and the entire French sentence. So that's, that's what the decoders do. Isn't it trivial to predict the English word because it's been given? Must be a misunderstanding. Oh, did I? Um, oh, so remember here that in the decoder, the first input is the start of sequence token. Um, and from that, we're predicting the first English word. So you're never given the word that you're trying to predict. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, in the which attention? After the cross yeah, after the cross attention. So when you said you have an unmasked like cross attention, so remember what we're referring to when we talk about masked self attention is we are masking some of the dot products between query and key that we've computed, right? So in this case, because the mask would be applied over the encoders representations, we already have all of the encoders representations, so there's no need for a mask. Okay, so let's move on then. <coughs> Um, so this was sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. This was actually the original uh, version of the transformer, but since then there have been many, many different things proposed. And um, I just wanted to give a high-level overview of all of the different types, and then we will start focusing on BERT in this class. So um, let me go ahead and do that. So, oh. <laughs> Common transformer configuration. <clears throat> All right. So um, the first one that we're going to talk about is the transformer encoder. Again, I mentioned at the start of class that BERT is the most prominent example of this. So in a transformer encoder, we generally have um, some word embeddings. And these are simply um, fed into an unmasked multi-head self-attention block. And uh, we can have as many layers of these as we want. And then finally, we get these tokens at the output. Note that these are the um, final layer token level representations and as we'll see later in this class these uh, representations can be useful for a variety of different um, NLP tasks like sentiment uh, classification or uh, question answering so um, 
If you just think about how do you train a transformer encoder independently of a decoder, it's kind of hard to envision, right? Because in the decoder, we are getting that error, right? The negative log probability of the next word at every time step. But we can't do that here because we already observe all of the input. So um, in BERT, there is a clever way to reformulate that language modeling objective into one that can be utilized to pre-train a transformer encoder. So we'll get into that in a bit, but uh, I'll just continue this overview because these terms like encoder and decoder and all of that you'll see in many different papers and it's important to understand what they're <coughs> uh, referring to. Okay, so um, say this is number one. And number two, we'll say the transformer decoder. So this is the very first thing that we talked about when we talked about transformers. Um, so here we have uh, the same, actually maybe I'll just copy this. We have the same um, process, except we are using masked multi-head self-attention. So the critical difference here is that in an encoder, this um, uh, attention is unmasked. In a decoder, the attention is masked. So the decoder is can be useful for generating text because of this masked um, multi-head self-attention. So you get the same kind of uh, outputs here, the final layer token level representations, but these are useful uh, in general for the same kinds of tasks that an encoder is useful for, except they're um, mostly used to predict the next words, right? So at test time, a decoder can be used to generate new text, whereas an encoder cannot, um, because the encoder observes all of the text ahead of time. So the critical difference here, maybe I'll make a little side box thing. Main differences. <coughs> Um, decoders can generate new text. Um, encoders generally cannot. Um, encoders observe a complete input. Um, decoders only observe a prefix, right? So remember the goal of a decoder is to predict the next word given some partial input. The goal of an encoder is given a complete full input, give me some good representations of that, um, that sentence. Yeah. So would it be correct to say encoding is almost like a sophisticated kind of embedding? Because it seems like in this structure it's, mostly, it's mainly just a pre-processing step. The decoder is the one actually yeah, so actually we can write that down. That's exactly right. Um, encoder's job is to produce powerful embeddings of the input. Decoder's is to generate. And you can see how the encoder and decoder can be connected together, as in the sequence to sequence example that we looked at before, to get both uh, the best of both, right? So you get a very powerful encoding of the French sentence, and then you use that to condition the decoder to generate English words. Yeah. Uh, Uh, yeah, so uh, encoders and decoders are commonly used in autoencoding setups where you have some sort of bottleneck representation. 
In this case, you don't have that, right? Because if you look at the um, sequence to sequence model here, there is no bottleneck. At every single time step of the encoder, you're using all of the token level embeddings that are produced of the French sentence. Um, if we were only using, say, the last uh, embedding, like this one over here, then um, you would have, well, you're kind of packing all the information of the French sentence into one vector and then decoding from there. Um, and this is a common setup in text-based autoencoding where you might have the French sentence, you compress it to a single vector, and then try and regenerate that sentence from that vector. Uh, this is not an interesting task these days, so people don't work on it as much. Yeah. Yes, um, the question is, can we independently train the encoder? We will get to that in uh, hopefully a couple of minutes. All right, let me move on then, because there are still yet other um, configurations of transformers that you will encounter. Um, the other one I will just skip over because we just talked about is the um, transformer encoder decoder or the sequence to sequence model. Um, one thing that you might want to know about these encoder decoder models is that they're not strictly restricted to just text. Um, it is very common to have the encoder uh, take in an image, for instance, instead of a piece of text. So you could do image captioning or generating some text conditioned on an image. These are all popular tasks. Um, if you've seen um, OpenAI's clip model, for instance, produces very powerful embeddings of images and of text. Um, these are all just encoder-based models. So um, I'm not going to draw this out because I literally just did that. Um, we'll move on to the final configuration that I want to discuss, which is a variant of the decoder called the prefix uh, LM. So you might see this um, in several papers. Um, it's a transformer prefix language model. Uh, this is very, very similar to a decoder, except part of the input to the decoder, you're not predicting the next word. So basically, it's just unifying the encoder-decoder model with a single network. Um, so let's see how this looks, because this is quite interesting. Um, and also, this is the most common way in which people are solving um, conditional language modeling tasks like machine translation um, today. Um, so let's say I still want to do French to English translation. <coughs> um, so I want, <coughs> want to be doing this. Um, so in a prefix LM, I'm going to just uh, represent all of these tokens in the same model. So note that this model now has to be able to represent both the French words and English words in the same vocabulary. So you have like a unified vocabulary that can represent both uh, languages. Um, it's very common to have a vo single vocabulary that can represent text written in hundreds of different languages nowadays. So the largest language models are trained on multilingual data. They are able to represent sequences that are comprised of text from many different languages. So you can uh, think about like code switching, for instance. Code switch text can be represented by these language models in a single vocabulary. We'll have a whole lecture later on in the semester about how this actually happens and how you can have a single vocabulary that represents multiple different languages. Um, the short answer is that you don't do it at the word level. That would be like a very, very large vocabulary. If you do it at a subword level, so you can include like some characters, some uh, combinations of characters, you can actually represent many different languages with a relatively compact vocabulary. So that's uh, what is done nowadays. Um, anyway, that was a kind of digression. Uh, now on to how we actually solve machine translation in this setup. So if you have this concatenated sequence of French tokens and English tokens, and your goal is to generate the English translation, 
You'll note that this model does not have to make any predictions on the French half of the sequence. So what we're going to feed this through something that we'll call partially masked. Multi-head <coughs> self-attention where only part of the sequence is masked, and that part of the sequence is the English side. The French side is always left unmasked, and no predictions are made on the French side of the sequence. So I have to draw a lot of these. Actually, let me just do this. <laughs> Okay, so let's say we get these vectors at output. These are the final layer uh, representations. So we are only going to do predictions on <coughs> the English side here. So then that uh, begs the question of what this mask actually looks like. Like, what does it mean to be partially masked? Um, so if you remember the original mask of the transformer <coughs> looked something like this. So um, the, the uh, side over here was set to minus in, well, oh, that was really bad. Right, so we uh, multiplied all our attention scores with this mask to avoid looking at future words. Right, so this was the original d original decoder mask. And now, what do you think this prefix lm mask looks like? If this was the original mask. <laughs> What's that? No, it does not look like the reverse. Yeah, so it looks something like this, uh, where for some part of the sentence, it's fully unmasked. And then for the other part, it's uh, masked. And so this is uh, associated with F1, F2, F3. This part after this um, full masking, uh, full unmasking ends is associated with the English side. Does that make sense to everyone? So what are the effects of applying a mask like this? Uh, so I'll call this the prefix lm mask. <coughs> so in this case, when I compute the representations uh, like this one and this one and this one, I have full access to all of the French tokens on this side, right? So if I look at the query key and value, let's say I'm computing the representation of this, um, this token right here. Um, and I have a key here, I have a key here, I have a key here. Unlike in mass self-attention, my query is going to look at all of these um, keys here because I'm not actually predicting any next word on the French side, right? So I'm allowed to do this. Now, when I get over here and I have a query, I'm not looking at the keys over here, right? I, that would be totally cheating. So instead, this query is going to look at all of the keys back here. And similarly, the next query here is going to look at um, the keys over here. OK, so this is getting really messy. But you can tell what, um, what is happening. Yeah. Uh, the French tokens? Yeah, uh, so all the tokens in the French sequence, uh -huh. when we look at uh, the keys from the French side, right? None of them will be looking 
they won't look at the English tokens. Yeah. Because remember, at test time, you want to generate the English tokens. So you won't have any English tokens to begin with. Right. You mean like here? Yes. Uh huh. Oh, I guess I drew this the other way. Sorry. So I should have I should have put these on the row side and not the column side. But yeah. Um, other questions? In this case. So if you see F1 here, it's looking at F1, F2, and F3. Um, so, uh, oh, 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 I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, I'll edit this later. But yeah, the, basically, there's a, a configuration of the mask that, that we are implementing here to prevent the English tokens from looking at the future English tokens, but the French tokens should be able to look at all of the future French tokens. Um, so this is commonly used when you have an input to a large language model like GPT-3, for instance, where you might say, translate this French sentence into English, here's a French sentence, and then you let it generate more tokens. Um, in this case, you don't actually want it to generate any next words on the input that you already provided it. So um, yeah, as the models get larger and larger, encoder, decoder models have not yet scaled to um, these huge scale networks. Uh, the biggest models like GPT-3 and ChatGPT are all decoder only models. Um, so they, they kind of work like this. Do you have a question? So people prefer these kinds of decoder-only models because they're very easy to pre-train. Like the pre-training objective is clear. It's just predict the next word. As we'll see, hopefully in this lecture, pre-training a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model is a little more difficult because you have to specify an input and an output. And the output is not necessarily just like predict the next word, right? That, that wouldn't be a very good objective. So you get all these uh, stranger objectives that are based around corrupting the input sequence and then um, correcting that sequence. And this may not be the right objective for several like text generation tasks. So I think this is the main reason why these models haven't been um, scaled up as much as um, like decoder only models. But uh, regarding your question, they work because they have a shared vocabulary for even like multi multiple languages. Um, and the models have seen lots of instances of like cases where you have to, given some input, predict some output, even if it's just predicting the next word. And it turns out that even if in pre-training you're also predicting the input, that doesn't seem to change things too much. It might actually help. Um, so the T5 paper has somewhat of a good analysis of these different configurations. Yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, like when we're training or at test time, we might have a batch of uh, examples as an input, and these examples can vary in length, right? So how do we apply these operations across a batch where the sequence, the French uh, inputs, the English inputs may be very different in size? Yeah, so it's common to use padding in these cases. Um, Generally, you can have a max length for, say, your French and your English sentence, and you'll just apply uh, masking to prevent the attention from looking at the padding tokens as, as well. OK, so let's, uh, OK, yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, so if you're using a decoder-only model for machine translation, you can always, uh, um, you know, like, 
uh, modify your decoder to not predict uh, the next word for a certain number of time steps. So this could include the English tokens. Usually you can just start the prediction at whatever time step that you want. So that's how that is done. All right, so let's move on to um, uh, encoders only. So I think in this, given the time left, I'll probably be able to get through the pre-training operations of BERT, um, which is an encoder only model. So for now, let's forget about the decoders. We'll get back to those in like the entire rest of the semester. Um, for now, let's look at uh, pre-training and encoder only transformer. All right. So several of you asked this question, right? If we just have an encoder with unmasked self-attention, how are we going to train this? Because we can't use next word prediction. All of the final layer token level representations have information about all of the future words as well as all of the previous words. Um, so BERT introduces an objective called masked language modeling. <clears throat> and this is a variant of the predicting the next word, except it allows you to actually look at words that occur in the future as well as the, the past. So let's take a look just at our usual example here, but we'll modify it a little bit. So let's say we have the students opened their books. I can finally write out the entire thing in the input. Okay, so remember that the encoder only networks will take the complete text as input, right? Um, not the partial text. There's no <laughs> prediction of the next word at each time step here. Right, we want to be able to apply um, unmasked multi-head self-attention here. So if this is our goal, the, the way that um, mask language modeling works is instead of giving the entire raw uh, input, we're going to choose at random some words to corrupt. So basically, we'll replace these words with a special mask token. And so you can see that the input to the model itself is corrupted. So now we don't have information about the word that goes into this mask token. So now, if we pass this through our L layers of um, masked, uh, sorry, unmasked uh, self-attention, we're going to get our usual final layer token level representations. Um, let me just move this down a little. And now we're going to um, predict opened at the position where uh, in the input we had a mask token instead of the correct uh, ground truth token. So what are some uh, comparisons between this task and the uh, next word prediction that we saw in language modeling? What are some pros and cons could you think of for both of these? Yeah, so in this mask language modeling task, you actually have more context than in a language modeling task. Um, so you actually have um, information from the future, which gives you more constraints over what this word could be. So for example, when we were predicting from just the students the next word, right? there's so many possible verbs or adjectives or whatever. Here we know that the next two words are their books, so this eliminates so many possibilities of the, the next word. So yeah, this is certainly one um, 
You could say advantage in that maybe this problem is easier than the language modeling problem. On the other hand, it's not clear how that affects the quality of the representations or the downstream, uh, like what you're going to actually use this model to do. Um, other thoughts on, on mask language modeling? I think one of the cons could be that we are not able to use our previous brain model like uh, the interpretability over prefixes because we have some. So mm -hmm. That's right. So here we don't get the conditional probability of the next word given all the previous words because we are actually cheating. We have information about the future. Um, really what we're computing here is um, so instead of P, let's say this is W3. Um, So this is uh, P of W, well, uh, three equals opened given um, W1 and W2. So this is what we normally have in a language model. Um, in mask language modeling, we have P W3 equals opened given W1, W2, uh, this mask token W4, W5, right? So in effect, we have the identity of all of the words except for the mask token, and we're, we're estimating this probability distribution. This one, however, cannot be used to generate text just naively because we have information about the, the future words, right? So... Um, there is a trade-off here. The, this model is more limited in its use cases because it can't easily be used for generation. Now, you can uh, conceive of different ways to use this for generation, right? You could just mask out, uh, you know, if you have word one, you can then produce like four mask tokens and ask it to fill in. But this is extremely slow, and it's not how the model was trained, so it's not going to generate text that's uh, as high quality as a decoder-only network. Could you also run into any issues where maybe, say, the context provided by word, word four or five is you know, harmful in some way? Like, say, word five is somewhere that can use in a variety of different contexts. I don't want to paint this as like a play as an instance that can be used in a lot of different ways. Uh -huh. but that's not too applicable to the prefix. And thus, uh, so in general, the words like W1, W2, W4, W5 are coming from human written text. So it's not like the model is generating these words. You expect to have human written text. And so that's how um, you know, the context in the future should always be helpful for making this prediction. If that context were model generated, then what you're saying is is definitely it could happen and it, it does happen in those cases where you try to use a model like this for text generation. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is this mask token different at different positions of the sequence? The answer is no. So as usual, I have not drawn the position embeddings which are added to these uh, representations of the, the words here. Um, so that's what makes it kind of positionally aware, but the mask token is the same at every position. Um, so the goal here, the pre-training objective, is given that position that the mask token occurred, predict the identity of the mask token. So we are in effect trying to force this uh, vector here to encode all of the information necessary to predict that next word. Um, and so the model itself learns when there's a mask token at a position, it's very important to you know, uh, have all the self-attention um, focus on what that word could be. Like the behavior at this put a token or this token may be different during training because there is no mask at the input. Um, okay, so another con of this approach is that during pre-training we have these mask tokens, but at if you wanted to use this model, it really doesn't make <coughs> 
make too much sense to um, have text with mask tokens, right? Where do you get text that has mask tokens in it? It's not really a common occurrence, right? So decoder-only models can be used on any arbitrary text because you just need to put a prefix in and it'll start generating words. This model is much harder to use in this way. So there's actually a mismatch between how the model is pre-trained and how it's used in a downstream task. Before I get to how we use this model to solve different tasks, I also want to highlight another con of this setup, which is that it is very inefficient to train compared to a language model. So in a language model, for this same sequence of five words, I would get five predictions of the next word, right? One at each position. In this case, I only get one prediction at the mask token, right? So if I have a batch of like 100 tokens, in the BERT paper, they recommend masking 15% of the tokens, which means I get 15 predictions at a given batch versus 100 predictions if I was doing normal language modeling. So uh, I may need to see more batches in order to um, uh, train this model. Now, on the other hand, this task is easier, so maybe you don't need to see as many training batches. This is something that is explored in the BERT paper, but it's still an inefficiency of this training method. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So in this case, couldn't I just mask each word and leave all the other words unmasked and then have a prediction at every position? I could certainly do that. The issue is that this requires me to have five different examples that are fed into my model, right? So I'm essentially duplicating the sequence five times to get that. Whereas in a language model, I just need to have one sequence and I can do the prediction at every time step. Uh, that's like the, like the mask position is important. Does that mean that like within or between the and layers, that mask has to stay the same? Yeah, so the mask you can see is actually a part of the input to the network itself. Let's see if there's any questions on, OK. What happens when the length of the input sentence, input French sentence is different from the English translation? So this is referring to the sequence to sequence model. This doesn't actually matter, right? Because uh, you are aggregating all the value vectors at the end into a single vector. So it doesn't matter if you have more key vectors than, um, you know, it, more encoder vectors than decoder vectors. What differentiates encoder training? Okay, we'll get into that later. Um, we're talking about it now. Wouldn't we also need self-attention within the English sequence to produce a coherent translation? So just to clarify, the decoder in a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model has both self-attention on the decoder side as well as cross-attention um, in integrating information from the encoder with the decoder. Um, what happens when multiple languages combine in the vocabulary have same words with different meanings? So remember that um, the context surrounding the word is very important in determining the re representation because we're doing self-attention. So if you have the same word that is part of the vocabula vocabulary of many different languages, it should be clear from the context which language that is and the model should behave appropriately. What happens when there could be multiple possibilities for a word to fit in a mask? Ah, this is a good question. This is also the case in language modeling, right? If I said students open there, there are many different words that are plausible. We only observe one in our training data. It's the same uh, issue with the mask language model, right? Students open their books is one plausible outcome. Students destroyed their books is, you know, at least an acceptable sentence. You could observe it, you know, in some cases. So uh, again, this is a function of your training data, right? You only observe the one um, word, and that's the word trying to maximize its likelihood. But many could be possible in this context. Yeah. Uh, the value vector for the mask token? Yeah, it's all, uh, all of the word positions have query key values associated with them in this case. So what is the token using with the mask? Is it all zeros? 
No, uh, that's a good question. I haven't talked about this. So uh, what is the embedding of the mask token? It, it is just added to the vocabulary as another type of word, and it's randomly initialized and trained. So it is not all zeros. It's probably some random dense vector that you can't really interpret. Um, as we'll see in this encoder-only approach, there are numerous special tokens. So there's a mask token. There's another token we'll talk about at some point called the CLS token, which is useful for adapting this model to different tasks. And um, there's like separator tokens if you want to have two pieces of text. So these are all just added to the vocabulary. Yeah, I mean, it is confusing because the model might expect this word to have some semantics that uh, it can use to understand the meaning of the full sentence, yet it does not have that. But the pre-training task is to kind of force the model to learn how to deal with these mask tokens and, and predict them properly. Uh, oh, well, okay, so it's hard to answer this question. The question was, will the mask token have a low attention score? Um, it's hard to say because the position of the mask token is extremely important, right? So you might want to have some um, attention on it just to know where in the sequence it is. Um, yeah, but these are all very hard to answer because they depend on the input, the model, et cetera. <coughs> Okay, so this is also interesting. What if we just remove the token entirely instead of having this artificial mask token? So what are some issues with doing this? Um, if you did this, then you would have to tell the model somehow where you want this prediction to happen, right? So how would you do that if you remove the token? Then it just looks like a normal sequence where maybe one part of the sequence is ungrammatical because something was removed. But you have to know where exactly to put the softmax, right? And um, that is a little tricky. So yeah, it's better to have this mask token just so it makes it easy to detect like what for the model also. Um, OK, so in the last 10 minutes here, let me um, just give you a quick uh, high level overview of how we use a model like BERT. So, <clears throat> This is what we call the pre-training task. So if you remember from very early on in the semester, we discussed this paradigm where we first pre-train a language model with a huge amount of text. So masked language modeling is also a self-supervised objective, right? I can create as many examples of this task as I want by just corrupting sequences of text that occur on the internet. It's just like language modeling. So I can train this model on a very, very large data set, and I can make it really big, but it's not useful, right? We already discussed I can't generate anything with it. Um, I don't know how to use this, this uh, model. So let's say we want to adapt this model to sentiment analysis. How do we use uh, masked LM? So this is a process called fine-tuning. And this is an important uh, term that you'll see in many, many papers, so you should um, understand it. Basically, fine-tuning refers to um, adjusting the parameters of a pre-trained model Uh, pre-train, we'll say LM, to uh, adapt it to a single downstream task. So downstream task is another bit of terminology that you will hear and read in many papers. It refers to a task that you actually want to solve. So. Uh, let's say you're Amazon and you want to build some sort of 
model that predicts a review score from a review, right? That's your end task. You might go about this by first pre-training a giant mask language model. Um, of course, you don't care about the mask language modeling task. That's not your end goal. Your end goal is to solve this sentiment analysis task. But the way you're doing it is this two-stage process of first pre-training a self-supervised model and then fine-tuning it on your downstream task. So um, let's take this example of sentiment. So here, I will take my um, model from before. One thing to note is that in this um, BERT model, the BERT encoder specifically, there's a second special token in addition to the mask, which is called the CLS token. CLS here refers to um, classifier. So uh, this is supposed to be used for classification tasks. And um, it is always prepended to every input, so it's always the first token of every sequence that is fed to the BERT model. Um, and there are many um, pre-training objectives that people have proposed for the CLS objective. So if you read the original BERT paper, um, they, they did this thing called next sentence prediction where the input was actually two different uh, segments of text and they asked the model, given the CLS token, predict whether these two segments are actually contiguous uh, within, um, like they follow each other in the ground truth text or if the second sequence is random and different than the first sequence and doesn't actually follow it. But later papers have shown that you don't actually need any sort of pre-training um, objective for the CLS uh, token. So that's why I'm just going to add it here as part of this masked um, uh, language modeling objective. So the CLS token is never masked, but otherwise it's just there. It, do it doesn't do anything else. So now, if I'm trying to solve sentiment analysis, remember the CLS token is always the first token of my sequence. And then I might have, you know, this movie is good. So I want to predict whether this sentence is positive or negative. <clears throat> so I'm going to feed this whole thing into the BERT model, um, which is essentially this encoder, unmasked, uh, multi-head self-attention for many different layers. And at the end, I get these vectors as um, output. These are the final layer token level representation. So this is the use case of the model, right? I have a complete review. Note that there are no mask tokens in this review, right? It would make no sense to mask any of these tokens. I want to know if this sentence is positive or negative, like a binary classification task. So what you do is you attach a new softmax layer to the CLS representation to predict positive. So we talked about the softmax layer as um, projecting the uh, vector representation into the space of the vocabulary. Here, the softmax projects the vector representation into a two-dimensional vector, one probability for positive, one probability for negative. So the math and all doesn't change, just the number of out output classes is two. So now, um, we, this is obviously a very different task than mask language modeling, right? Yeah. Yeah, it could be anywhere, like first or last, but uh, the pre-training objective, they always put it first. So if you want to use it, it has to be first in the, the BERT model. There's nothing theoretically saying that it should be first. Or... <clears throat> okay, so we have this new softmax layer that we're adding in the fine-tuning stage. So let me just write that here. New softmax layer that looks like this. So um, your prediction is uh, 
soft max of um, w o times the uh, what are we going to call this h c l s where HCLS is the final hidden representation associated with the CLS token. So this is added during the fine-tuning stage. Um, so when we're fine-tuning, we need a labeled data set. So we need like uh, a lot of reviews where with the review text is paired with the positive or negative label. Um, so this is supervised learning here. We are just starting with a pre-trained model and then tuning it um, with the error that we get from our labeled data set. So then when we do backprop, we take the error from here, it propagates into here, it propagates into every layer and finally into the embeddings. So, um, so we basically start with the pre-trained model parameters and then we adjust them by a backprop by adding this new softmax layer, computing a loss that is on our training sentiment analysis data set not our mask language modeling data set. And then we backprop through the um, pre-trained model, adjust its parameters to maximize the likelihood of our sentiment data set. Okay, so um, this is much better than just uh, training directly from scratch on the labeled sentiment data set. Uh, why is that? Yeah, so the idea again is that through mask language modeling, we learn a lot of generic information about how the language works and, you know, what are the general syntactic rules of the language, things that are obviously useful in sentiment analysis. Um, then during the fine tuning stage, we learn the specific form of the task, right? So maybe the BERT model already has some notion of sentiment that it's learned from the mask language modeling stage. Like if you imagine this movie is mask, I hated it, right? This is a very strong predictor of sentiment. If the model is able to predict bad, then it understands that context. It understands the sentiment already. So the fine tuning phase is basically trying to get the skills that are most necessary to solving the downstream task um, and trying to um, specialize the model to use those skills to solve the task. Okay, so next time, uh, okay, yeah, let me ask, uh, answer one question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So the way I've just drawn it, we are adjusting every single parameter of this network, which can be hugely expensive if this is a very deep and large model. Like we may not be able to do it. So um, you could, for example, just fine tune the top layer or just fine tune the softmax layer or something like this. There are experiments doing this in the BERT paper and they show that um, there is some performance loss compared to adjusting all the parameters, but it's not that much. So it is a good alternative if you don't have that many resources. All right, so um, next week we will start with, uh, we'll, we'll show how to use BERT for question answering tasks, and then we'll talk about the T5 model to finish up this kind of tour of different transformer con configurations. So see you there.